joining because uh, he had a rather complicated schedule. And uh, well, Josh is um, at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, in the Department of Ecology and Evolution, and uh, is one of these. Uh, I don't know whether uh, recovering physicists, but probably has recovered since a long time because uh, he has ventured uh, okay. in many uh, different areas of uh, uh, also social sciences and uh, this is what uh, he will tell us about today. So thank you very much, Josh. Uh, Matteo, thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me? Can I just see you wave? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, wonderful, okay. Great. Yeah, I'm very sorry I cannot be there in person. Um, I really, uh, I'm very sorry that uh, I'm missing the conference in person, but I'm non happy nonetheless to share with you um, this unpublished work about um, populations of individuals who are trying to uh, make social decisions in the context of uncertainty. Um, I'm not sure exactly how well it will fit into the York thematic um topic of uh, agents, but it, it is, in fact, a topic about how agents um, come to collective outcomes, but in the face of um, individual decisions with uncertainty. So this is work that is principally developed by um, a terrific and very young graduate student, Guoqing Wang, who's visiting my lab for two years from Peking University. Um, ah, okay. So let me start with this very uh, basic background. Um, uh, this talk begins with the idea that life is always uncertain and sometimes we're faced with these classic um, choices between um, option A, where someone will give us $50 for sure, or option B, where someone will give us either $100 or $0 with even odds. And I have to say, I find this kind of decision difficult personally. <laughs> and uh, this difficulty was in some sense resolved, of course, by uh, von Neumann and Morgenstein, who taught us how to cope with such difficulties. And they have this very simple idea of um, utility theory, where they say, well, you should not think about the money that you could win or lose, but rather how happy you will be. And they have this idea of a utility function, the satisfaction that you may derive from some material payoff X, um, either $50, $100, or $0. And uh, as far as I understand it, I'm not an economist. Utility theory basically says, think about how you feel and do what will make you happy. Um, and so there are several ways um, you might feel about these options. Um, you might prefer the first option, option A, $50 assuredly, which means that you are so-called um, risk averse because your utility for $50 exceeds the combination um, of your utility for zero and your utility for 100 with even odds. Or you could be risk seeking or you could be risk neutral. Um, and so this is of course the uh, bedrock idea in um, class classical economics. It's especially useful when evaluating um, decisions in non-social contexts. What I wanna talk about is that the same question in socialist context. I should say first though, that um, there are many possible feelings you might have about the world. Let's say there are many possible utility functions that differ um, most importantly in their convexity or uh, concavity. And this particular measure, the acceleration divided by the, the, the slope is at least an affine, and affine transformation variant measure of um, whether an individual's utility function means that they're risk averse or risk seeking. And so this is a common measure of um, how people feel about risk at the individual level. The question that I want to talk about is social decisions, not just choosing between the two different bets, but what about when individuals are making social decisions? So according to the combination of utility theory and game theory, what humans should do, but don't actually really do in practice is compute the Nash equilibrium for their expected utility. Um, and this, this all sounds well and good, and this is, but the problem is that humans don't really do this. No, no one no normal human, maybe an economist would do this, would walk around and compute their Nash equilibrium for an expected utility in a, in a social setting when they're making strategic decisions whose outcomes depend upon each other's um, strategic decisions at the same time. What people really do, um, what human agents really do is they use social learning. We tend to imitate others who seem to be doing uh, better than us. And by the word seem here, I mean, they seem to be doing from 
our perspective, they seem to be doing better than us. Um, meaning from the perspective of our risk aversion, they seem to be doing uh, better than us. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, the question then is, although we have a perfectly good understanding of um, the concept of Nash equilibria um, with risk, can we nonetheless develop a theory of social learning where individuals imit each, imitate each other based on how they're, how they're doing, um, a kind of a version of evolutionary game theory that incorporates uncertainty in outcomes and also incorporates variation in individual attitudes towards risk. And so that's what I want to talk about. And what does that mean for the long-term population outcomes um, of individuals engaged in a certain social interaction? So we developed a very simple model where each individual in the population may have their own particular utility function, UI, and we've chosen this actually sort of standard form for a utility function. S here denotes what is called by evolutionary biologists the intensity of selection. It just says, how much does your payoff pi affect your satisfaction at all? So it's the strength of selection. More importantly, delta I is a measure of individual I's own particular risk preference. And so if delta I is positive, it means the individual's risk-seeking, negative, risk-averse, or zero, it means they're risk-neutral. So each individual in the population has their own potentially different utility function or risk, risk um, sensitivity. Um, and we have the kind of simplest setup, which is actually a very classic setup in evolutionary game theory. For a large population of individuals playing pairwise, it's a well-mixed population, one-shot games. And so in general, each individual can choose one of two strategies, which I'm just going to generically call, call cooperator defect. Um, and there's an associated payoff matrix for the game that individuals are playing against each other with payoffs A, B, C, and E. And in other words, if both people cooperate, then they each receive um, payoff A and so on. And what that implies then is that if individuals in the population have a current, um, if the cooperators in the population have a current frequency X, then the average payoff to a cooperator is AX. A cooperator will meet another cooperator with chance A and receive payoff A. Um, chance X and receive payoff A, or they will meet a defector with um, chance one minus X and receive payoff B and so on. So there's an average payoff for a cooperator and a defector in a population composed of um, frequency X cooperators. And this gives rise to what what, I, what may be, in, in evolutionary biologists, this is a very standard equation. I hope it's a, it's a, it's a standard equation, a, a, an intuitive equation for, for everyone in the audience as well. It's how the it's the dynamics of how the frequency of cooperators will change over time. Um, it has the form S X one minus X times the difference between the average payoff of the cooperators and the average payoff of the defectors. Um, okay, so this is what is what would be considered completely classical um, uh, imitation or social learning in a population or evolutionary game theory in a population without any um, uncertainty or without any um, risk preferences. What we want to finally introduce now, and this is the, the content of, of the talk, um, is the idea that there may be noise and differential risk um, risk preferences in the population. And the kind of noise that we decided to describe is that although each individual will indeed receive a deterministic payoff, pi i, from their pairwise interactions with everyone else, um, in often, it, it's often the case um, in populations that um, you don't have perfect information about each other's payoffs. And so we have only no one individual has only a noisy observation of another individual's payoff, which makes it complicated for them to determine how they should, um, whether or not they should copy each other's um, strategies. So in particular, we're going to assume that pairs A, pay, player I's payoff in the eyes of J um, is not in fact equal to pi I, but it's just some noisy perturbation of pi I. So um, J um, sees I as receiving payoff pi I plus some um, sigma I J uh, times psi, some, some unbiased uh, standard Gaussian. So people have only noisy information about each other's payoffs. Um, now this noise term sigma I J depends upon players I and, I and J, but in, for us, we're going to say that it depends only upon the strategies that players I and J Adopt. So a cooperator observing another cooperator might have a, a less noisy or a more noisy um, way of assessing their payoff than a defector observing a cooperator or a defector observing another defector and so on. So 
depending upon your strategy, you have different amounts of transparency of, an, of each other's um, payoffs. And then instead of the classical model where player I will imitate player J according to player J's payoff relative to all of their players in the population, um, in this setting, player I cannot, in fact, actually observe player J's payoff. They can only observe a noisy perturbation. And so instead of so-called payoff bias imitation, which is the classical way of, um, so of developing a model of social learning, we will replace um, payoff bias imitation with expected utility bias imitation. That is to say, player I will imitate player J with a probability that depends upon I's expected utility um, from adopting J's strategy compared to I's expected utility from adopting any other player K's um, uh, strategy. So we replace the actual payoffs pi J and pi K with I's expected utility of the, um, of, that they would have from adopting those um, strategies. Um, so this is a very simple equation. It's just that um, we're just we've just modified the model um, in this simple way. The question, one question you might ask yourself is how how actually would player I um, assess their expected utility of adopting J's strategy? Um, in some sense, it would imply they need to know the noise distribution. Um, but in practice, I think this is actually not that hard. Um, the player I gets to observe many, many different players. So player I will observe many, many different cooperators in the population at any point in time, and they will just observe empirically that there's variation in the material payoffs that player J, that cooperators have. And so they will observe the mean and the variance, they'll observe the entire distribution of material payoffs that every other, any other strategy has. And so they can, if they know their own risk preference, compute their expected utility from adopting any other player's strategy. And so this this equation here has some makes some physical sense. Um, individuals really could use this this rule for adop for adopting a different strategy in an attempt to um, increase their expected utility. Now, finally, the question is, what does this mean? Now that they're for for the dynamics of of um, strategic evolution in a population, if there is in fact noise and payoff observation, and there's individual variability um, in risk preferences, what does it mean for the um, outcome for the, the collective? Um, so I'm going to answer that first in the simple setting when um, risk preferences we're going to assume to be fixed, and the only thing that can evolve is individual strategies. So risk preferences are immutable, and strategies evolve by imitation. And for simplicity, at least, I'm just going to start by saying that there's only two possible risk preferences. Either everyone in the population either has delta I equal to delta 1, they're, let's say positive, meaning they're risk-seeking, or delta I equal to delta 2 negative, um, so they're risk-averse. Um, and let's just fix that a proportion P of the population is risk-seeking, and, and they never get to change their risk preferences. There are still, then, four different types of individuals in the population, there's the risk-seeking cooperators, the risk-averse cooperators, and so on. Um, and let me just show you at least some initial stochastic simulations, and then I'll tell you how we can actually analyze this problem. Um, first of all, in this exact same model, but if there's zero, if the sigmas are all zero, so there's actually no payoff uncertainty, then the long-term behavior of this model is exactly what we would observe classically a population composed initially of a large number of um, cooperators playing the prisoner's dilemma game will uh, converge eventually to, the, in fact, what is the Nash equilibrium of everyone defecting. So that this is without any noise at all. And here's a situation where there is noise. Um, in particular, um, it's noisy when a defector tries to assess a cooperator's payoff or when a cooperator tries to affect a defector twice tries to observe of a defector's payoff. There's actually no noise when individuals of one strategy um, assess this, the path of this individual of the same strategy. Um, there's two possible uh, risk preferences. Either it can be risk-seeking, delta 1 equals 0.2, or risk-averse, delta 2 equals negative 0.2. And in this first situation, I'm going to assume that the population is on average um, risk neutral. So the proportion of individuals who are risk seeking is the same as those who are risk neutral. And interestingly, and I think this is actually not surprising in retrospect, in a risk neutral population, the behavior of, um, of the strategy evolution is exactly as if there was no uncertainty whatsoever. Um, so at least if the population is on, on average risk neutral, the game 
plays out and the strategies plays out um, as if there was no uncertainty. What's interesting, and this is actually really the first result in the talk, is that things can be very different when the population is on average risk averse or on average risk seeking. So this is the extreme case of a, of a very risk averse population. They are playing the prisoner's dilemma, but nonetheless, as, it, um, as you can see here, the outcome is actually bistable. Um, the population, depending upon its initial composition, could emer could evolve to um, all defection, or it could in fact evolve to all cooperation, um, which is a very non-classical outcome for the prisoner's dilemma. Or if the population is risk-seeking, the population will always evolve to a stable mixture of cooperators and defectors, um, which again would never happen under a standard prisoner's dilemma, and somehow is the result of uncertainty and um, variation in risk preferences in the population. So we can actually analyze this problem um, uh, uh, more or less completely. Um, we can work out what is the chance, um, based on the rules of imitation that I specified, that in one, this, so we're actually going to initially imagine a, a um, finite population uh, stochastic process. What's the chance that the probability of cooperators X will increase by one over N in one imitation event? And so we have to, to um, keep track of the frequencies of all the four different types in the population. We'll say the frequency of the delta one cooperators is Q, the delta two cooperators is X minus Q, and so on. And these this this coordinate um, system has the feature that indeed the overall frequency of cooperators is X, and the overall frequency of risk averse risk seeking people is P. In any case, the um, I guess I shouldn't go into too much detail, the chance that in one um, imitation event, the frequency of overall cooperators increases by one over n, well, that can happen in two possible ways. Either a delta one defector will imitate a cooperator, and that occurs when a delta one de um, defector who are, who are in the population of frequency P minus Q um, assesses that according to their delta one um, risk preference, the cooperator that the cooperator um, a, that they would they would have a, a certain expected payoff by adopting the cooperator um, the cooperator strategy, which is in this case, let's say um, this is the probability that they would adopt the cooperator strategy given the the current frequencies of, of the two strategies in the population. It, the the x could also increase if a delta two type um, a risk averse um, defector imitates the cooperator, which um, occurs with this probability. So we can work out all these four possibilities that the cooperator frequencies will increase or decrease by um, one over n, or that the proportion of cooperators who are risk seeking will increase by one over n. And, that, and then taking the limit of a large population size and assuming that um, selection is weak and risk preferences are small, we get this system of ODEs, which has a really beautiful um, structure that this first ODE has X dot, the frequency of cooperators, is S times a bunch of stuff. And the second um, equation is at Q dot, um, the frequency of cooperators who are risk seeking evolves at rate one. And so it, this is a fast equation relative to this one. So there's a natural separation of time scales, which means that Q will um, immediately um, approach uh, Px much more quickly than the frequency of cooperators will change. So let's say that the frequency of the two types will, um, uh, uh, the frequency of risk aversion in each strategic type will immediately um, equilibrate to the frequency of risk aversion in the whole population. And so we get this, as a result, we only get a single ODE that describes the whole frequency of cooperators in the population. And now this, this, this equation is, um, very similar. I'm, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here, but it's very similar to the, cla to the classical equation. It has pi c minus pi d, but it's modified by this term delta bar v c minus v d, where delta bar is the average risk preference in the population, and v c is sort of the average uncertainty when a random individual observes the path of a c type of a cooperator individual, and likewise v d is the average uncertainty of observing um, a D type individual. So we can see immediately that if delta bar is zero, if, this, if the population is on average risk neutral, then this really will behave like a classical, um, like a classical uh, system. In fact, we can compare this equation for the um, system with, with payoff uncertainty and risk, risk variation to the classical system. 
And they both had the form sx1 minus x times some sort of linear um, linear function in, um, in, in x. And we can understand that these two different systems by, and one way to understand these two different systems is to notice that this system with risk aversion compared to this system without, without risk aversion, all we've really done is transform the payoff matrix A, B, C, D in the classical setting to some other alternative but effective payoff matrix that arises in this setting with risk aversion. It's A, B, C, D plus this um, other matrix that depends upon the average um, risk aversion in the population and the noise levels of one strategy observing another. And so this, this equation here really helps us understand all of these results. What we realize is that this is under this transformation of the effective game that people are playing um, when there's risk aversion, this prisoner's dilemma game, although in fact they are in fact playing a prisoner's dilemma game in all these cases, because of the risk, when there's no risk aversion, um, sorry, when, there's, when it's risk neutral, they still are playing a prisoner's dilemma game. But when they're very risk averse, they're playing a different game in effect. They're playing a stag hunt game, which explains why um, there is by stability. And if they're very risk seeking, they're effectively playing a snowdrift game. And so we can understand the dynamical outcomes here by realizing that risk aversion in the population sort of changes the nature of the game that people are playing. Okay, my last few minutes, I want to talk about um, something a little bit more exciting in some sense. So in this setting so far, the risk preferences of each individual have been entirely fixed. Um, that's to say, Every individual was either risk averse or risk seeking, and they could update their strategy if they thought it was going to increase their expected utility. Um, what happens, however, if both the strategies that people um, play, but also even their risk preferences co-evolve? And this is actually much more realistic. I mean, people may have, certainly my own risk preferences have, have changed over time as I've gotten older. Um, um, and there are a lot of empirical studies that show that um, individuals who are wealthier, in fact, even just a shock in wealth, some sort of quick injection in cash, um, tends to make them uh, less risk averse or even more risk seeking. And so we're going to now study a very similar model. But after each individual eye updates his or her strategy, they can also choose at rate with probability U to update their risk preference. And in particular, if they're more wealthy, they tend to choose, they tend to, they have a, they, they, they choose the more um, risk-seeking um, preference more with a higher probability than the risk-averse preference. So, so in fact, if their wealth is greater than some threshold eta, then um, they are more likely to choose the risk-seeking um, preference. And there are still four types of individuals, the risk-seeking cooperators, the risk-averse cooperators, and so on. But the frequency of um, the risk-seeking types is no longer static. It's rather dynamic in time. It's still conveniently true that the, the this this parameter this this variable q is fast, and so we are left with only a two dimensional ODE that keeps track of the overall frequency of cooperators in the population and the overall frequency of risk seeking individuals in the population, and they evolve according to these 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 two ODEs here. Um, sorry, give me one second. Okay, and so here's the results um, of um, what happens when there's co-evolution of strategies and risk preferences in the in the population. What we observe, and this is a population playing the prisoner's dilemma games, that um, on the left here are, is an infinite population, on the right is in a finite stochastic population, the finite population with the stochastic process. What we observe, and this is was actually very surprising to me, is we only have two types in the population, but we observe that there can be um, oscillating but decaying um, dynamics to a stable composition of um, types in the population, or in other regimes, there can be even what seem to be persistent cycles. And in fact, we can prove there really can be limit cycles um, in the in a in a in a um, very simplified prisoner's dilemma. In fact, we can get the we can derive an exact condition under which there will assuredly be limit cycles. Um, and let me just sort of quickly walk you through the intuition here. It kind of makes sense that there might be limit cycles, um, even stable stable limit cycles in this setting. Um, the reason why is that if you are in a state where everyone in the population is defecting, 
Um, well, let's start up here. If you're in a state where, where everyone in the population is, defect, is defecting, but they're risk-seeking, since everyone is defecting, the population has very low payoff. Um, and But they're currently risk-seeking. But when people have very low payoff, we've already assumed that they will tend to, if you have low payoff, to convert to being a more risk-averse individual. So at a slow rate, because U is less than one, a risk-defecting sorry, a, a full defecting but risk-seeking population will convert to a full defecting risk-averse population. Now, once we're in the full defecting risk-averse um, um, population, if the transparency of the cooperator payoffs is greater than the transparency of the defector of payoffs, so that the noise in observing cooperators is, is, uh, um, is lower than the noise in observing defectors, that will move us um, We've actually already seen this, but in the prior slide, from um, a, um, from a, a defecting situation with risk aversion to a cooperating um, situation with risk aversion, and once we have a very wealthy population, everyone's cooperating, but they're risk averse. There will again be movement towards risk seeking behavior um, because wealthier individuals tend to tend to um, convert to risk seeking behavior, and so on. And so, under the appropriate conditions, which are outlined here. We can prove there really will be a limit cycle. Um, this last condition here is actually also kind of interesting. This is the condition that ensures that the internal equilibrium is unstable. And what it means is that the rate at which up risk preferences are updated has to be sufficiently small. Um, so people have to evolve their strategies more quickly than they evolve their risk preferences for there to be these limit cycles. And this, and the reason why is that this tends this leads to overshoot. Um, of X relative to P in a promotes limit cycle. So we can really understand why and how we can get stable limit cycles where we have an oscillating um, collective behavior where people are oscillating between um, defection and cooperation and between risk aversion and risk seeking. Um, so it turns out that um, those are not the, that's not the only that dynamic that can occur when there's a coevolution of risk preferences and strategic behaviors, even in the prisoner's dilemma, there can be limit cycles, there can be a stable coexistence of both types, but there's actually seven different qualitatively different dynamical um, behaviors that can occur in the, in what's actually a pretty simple situation. People are playing a very simple prisoner's dilemma, um, but there's uncertainty and payoffs. There's seven different dynamical um, behaviors that can occur, and we can entirely understand in what regimes we will reach each of these seven different outcomes. And by regimes, I mean for what values of the parameters of the amount of noise when one strategic type observes another, and for what um, values of um, the difference between the risk-seeking and the risk-averse types um, will we fall into each of these different dynamical regimes. And I guess the bottom line here is that, and this is close to where I want to end, um, we this adding risk aversion um, and adding uncertainty to uh, the standard framework of evolution of social imitation leads to a, a huge range of um, diverse dynamical outcomes, including things that actually can never occur with just two types, like like persistent oscillations of two different types um, in classical evolutionary game theory. And nonetheless, it's not un, un, uninterpretable. We can really understand. Um, how risk aversion um, and uncertainty will modulate um, social behavior, um, at least in these simple um, game theoretic models. And so I'm going to end right there. The basic conclusions are that uncertainty can sort of turn the social world upside down, meaning it can, it can transform any one game, any one sort of form of strategic interaction into any other one, effectively changing the path matrix of the game that people are playing. Uncertainty can make the social world revolve around. It can induce limit cycles, um, even though there's only two strategies in the game, which is something that can never be observed um, classically. But one general rule, which actually even might have some policy implications, is that generally speaking, in all of these situations, transparency helps cooperation when the population is predominantly risk averse, which is the, the case in the real world. Um, and we've seen that when when um, it's more easy to observe the cooperator payoff, this actually facilitates the evolution of cooperation in the risk averse settings. And this kind of makes this this kind of has some implications to me. It means that 
loosely speaking, it means that if there is some way for you to sort of broadcast um, in a verifiable way what your payoff was, then this would be to, to your advantage as a cooperator. So if you're if you're playing uh, cooperatively in a collective action problem or in a prisoner's dilemma, it's good for you to broadcast the, in a verifiable way what payoff you have. So even if you have a very low payoff, it's good for you to broadcast what it is. And you'd have to have some sort of mechanism of broadcasting this in a way that can be verified. But, um, and there are mechanisms like this. I mean, there are universities, for example, that publish salaries, um, or even there's voluntary sharing information about salaries. And this suggests that um, if people who are pro-social um, broadcast how well off they're doing, this is in, in the end going to typically help pro-sociality um, spread in a population. So I think I'm going to stop there thinking um, my student, Guo Cheng Wang, who really developed most of the key ideas here, but also, of course, thinking Mateo and ICTP um, for, for hosting me, even from a distance. Thank you very much. So, oh, it's very interesting. I'm sure there are questions. So, so if not, I, I think I also have a question. So it looks like uh, the way you put noise uh, or this observation noise is that, of course, uh, you know the payoff of your strategy. You don't know the payoff of the other strategy, right? And uh, so I was wondering what this uh, means uh, if you have other games like uh, Battle of the Sexes, where essentially you have asymmetric, I mean, there's a coordination game, asymmetric coordination game. So did you study also these other games or can you have? Yeah, we studied, we studied all possible two by two games. So the, the, the analysis is general. We didn't just study the prisoner's dilemma. And, well, actually I can show you, Matteo. Um, so here's, for example, that's like a snowdrift game and and oh sorry i'm sharing my screen but you can't see it but yes the short answer is yes we we, we analyzed all possible two by two games including battle of the sexes coordination anti-coordination games and there you can get again get cyclical behavior really like non-classical behavior if there's noise and observation of the other of other people um but you're but the key question i think you're asking is we assume there's noise and observation as opposed to as opposed to noise and the actual payoff you see you receive is that what you're and th th that actually is an important choice that we the the kind of noise that we were discussing is there's uncertainty in in um knowing how other people are doing exactly um it, we're kind of separately and starting to analyze the other problem, which is when the actual payoff you receive is itself noisy. Um, and that leads to actually fairly different dynamics than noise, noise and observation. So both of the, the, those are actually very different problems um, with different behavior. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we, we thank you again. Uh, uh, and we pass to the next uh, uh, speaker.